It's a lovely weekend afternoon, and your friends invite you to go to the beach. Little do you know of the hidden dangers lurking in those sandy dunes. As you glide through that crystal clear water, you cut your foot on an old rusted can someone threw away. You wash out the wound with seawater and get back to having fun, because it's just a small cut. And what's the worst that could happen? Today's video will cover a few medical case studies of ER patients exhibiting strange symptoms but all have a shared eventual diagnosis. We will also be covering a prominent modern myth surrounding this medical condition. Our aim is to educate and shed light on a common misconception and, as always, we recommend speaking with your doctor if you have any health concerns. And with that out of the way, let's get into it. A 78-year-old man living in Mexico turned up at the ER complaining of jaw pain he had been experiencing for a few days. He had difficulty opening his mouth and also experienced dysphonia, a disorder where muscle spasms impede regular speech. He had a mildly distended but non-tender stomach region and upon further inspection, a healing wound about 5 centimeters long and 2 centimeters wide. The man said that he had received it at work two weeks prior when he fell off a tractor and into muddy water. He also admitted, after doctors inquired, that he had not received his immunizations in recent history, nor could he recall receiving them as a child. He did, however, receive topical medication for his injury from a local medical practitioner at the moment of the injury. On his fourth day in the hospital, he suffered from a severe apnea which closed his airway and a cardiac arrest shortly after. He was then given a tracheotomy, which is a fancy word for poking a hole under someone's vocal cords so they can breathe through a tube. And after three weeks on a cocktail of antibiotics, he was released from the hospital. A 48-year-old man arrived at the ER five days after receiving a cut to his foot from a grinding wheel. He said he was experiencing sensitivity to light, muscle contractures, and back pain. Shortly after, he began to experience seizures and then suffered a cardiac arrest. Doctors resuscitated him, gave him some anticonvulsants, and learned that he had not been immunized in the last decade. He was then put under anesthesia before surgeons removed contaminated tissue, administered antibiotics, and discharged him shortly thereafter. A 77-year-old woman went into the ER after a few days of experiencing jaw tightness and lesions in her mouth. She was found to have acute oral candidiasis, the overgrowth of fungus on the tongue and inside the mouth. She was treated and sent home. Two days later, she returned after suffering a number of seizures, insisting that she did not receive any injuries before experiencing symptoms, and that she had received all her vaccinations as a child. She was then treated for depression and somatization, which is a fancy word for intense physical distress caused by emotional stressors. After two weeks in the hospital, she was finally diagnosed properly and given antibiotics, but it was too late. After 24 days in the hospital, she had suffered massive brain damage, pneumonia, cardiac arrest followed by more seizures, her lungs filling up with liquid, and sepsis which led to her untimely demise. Here we have three different cases with different circumstances. One man cut his arm falling from his tractor, another received injuries from a grinding wheel, and the last presented with a case of oral thrush. What do all three of these patients have in common? Well, besides suffering from cardiac arrest, they were all eventually diagnosed with tetanus. Once diagnosed, each patient was given antibiotics. However, only two of three cases survived. It's likely that you've heard that if you cut yourself on a rusty nail, you're in danger of contracting tetanus. None of our cases involved a rusty nail, but two of them received an injury from some sort of metal, so rust could be present. But I have a feeling there's more to this. Tetanus, usually referred to as lockjaw, is a bacterial infection characterized by symptoms of muscle spasms, difficulty swallowing and speaking, strong convulsions triggered by phenomena as minor as talking, breathing, or bright light, and trismus, which is also referred to as lockjaw. All right, hold up. Lockjaw is also known as tetanus, but lockjaw is also also known as trismus. So then is tetanus also known as trismus? Is trismus the same thing as tetanus? Your explanations are decaf level unsatisfying. Oh, snap. Whoa, they're a big guy. I think you need to simmer down. Trismus is just when someone can't open their jaw all the way. It's only one of the symptoms of tetanus. Correct. Tetanus almost always causes trismus. And since trismus is known colloquially as lockjaw, the two terms have become synonymous. 
Now, what's worse is that the muscle spasms from the tetanus infection can lead to airway blockages, which can trigger cardiac arrest. Step on a crack and break your mother's back. More like step on a nail and then your organs fail. Crude, but correct. Tetanus is caused by the bacteria Clostridium tetani, or C. tetani, which is frequently found in soil, dust, and animal feces. The bacteria isn't dangerous to all in the aforementioned substances because it can only grow in oxygen-deprived environments. Unfortunately for us, the inside of a healing wound is an oxygen-deprived environment. Contracting tetanus is most often caused by infections of saliva or feces, puncture wounds, crushing injuries, and burns, up until the Second World War. Oh, hey, 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 whoa. I think you mean the Second World Demonetization. Of course. Up until the Second World Demonetization, soldiers would commonly suffer from severe tetanus infections due to bayonet and bullet wounds left untreated or uncleaned. The C. tetani bacteria inoculates in an open wound and release tetanospasm toxins, which attack motor neurons and inhibit the release of the neurotransmitters GABA and glycine, which you'll remember if you watched our video on sleep paralysis. And if you haven't, go watch it! Click on it after this video's done! Unless you're a coward and scared of a few itty bitty sleep demons. As I was saying, GABA and glycine control muscle inhibition. When they're blocked, cells cannot mitigate motor functions in response to stimuli, which can lead to the uncontrollable spasms associated with the infection. The incubation period for the C. tetani bacteria is anywhere from 1 to 60 days, though on average symptoms begin appearing from 7 to 10 days. Once the tetanospasm toxins reach the brainstem, autonomic dysfunction begins, which throws off the brain's ability to control the heart, the pupils, intestines, sweat glands, and bladder, among other things. The severity of symptoms depends on the location of the initial infection in relation to the central nervous system. In addition to that, the spasms from the tetanus toxin can be so violent you could even break your own back from the convulsions. Oh, oh, is it like when Peter Parker gets his superpowers and suddenly he's too strong for his own good? Except, instead of accidentally breaking his own glasses when he picks them up, the muscles in his back convulse so hard that they break his spine? Yes, exactly. And he ends up bending like a handful of uncooked spaghetti? Or like Gwen Stacy in Spider-Man issue 121. Oh, that's not good. The likelihood that tetanus will get that bad is about 10%. Even among those who are vaccinated. The rate is even higher in those unvaccinated, at 20 to 45%. 10% is still way higher than I want, bro. The weather forecast today said there was only going to be a 10% chance of slight drizzle today. The good news is, despite there being long-term motor and neuropsychiatric complications in survivors, most make full recoveries. According to the American Center for Disease Control, tetanus is a medical emergency. If you believe that you have tetanus, you should get to the hospital as quickly as possible. The most common treatment for tetanus requires the administration of human tetanus immune globulin, or TIG, which is a mixture of donated human blood containing tetanus antibodies. Essentially, it's a blast of proteins that attacks C. tetani before it is able to release its neurotoxins. The idea that a rusty nail gives you tetanus is misleading, insofar as it leads one to believe that rust is the culprit, though I still wouldn't recommend ignoring it. The long and short of it is that any open wound in contact with dirt is liable to be infected by C. tetani. You can 100% get tetanus from a rusty nail, but rust is not the reason one contracts tetanus. It's a catalyst. Oh, I love cat lists. Let's do one now. Calico, Siamese, He said Persian, catalyst, mango, as in a person or thing that facilitates face, an event. Bruce saying Siberian, that the nail is just making it easier for the Bombay, bacteria to infect you. It doesn't actually make you sick on its own. American exactly. Girl. Havana Brown. Rust is just iron oxide, the chemical combination of iron and oxygen, which is completely harmless to humans. We use it as food coloring, paint, and it even exists in our red blood cells. Rust is nothing to fear. <coughs> but like we talked about earlier, tetanus is a bacterial infection, so the real threat is on a much smaller scale than a stray nail. Rust is, however, a likely indicator that a nail has cultures of bacteria already living on it. A rusty nail is also probably less sanitary than a fresh nail as well. The biggest worry is that the rust provides small nooks and crannies for dirt to collect, so it's easy for a puncture wound from a rusty nail to become infected. What do you think of when I say 4th of July? Probably hot dogs, baseball, and inappropriate uses for an American flag. But what if I told you that tetanus used to be as patriotic as Budweiser and barbecues? The C. tetani bacteria is so malevolent that the United States had to come up with a term to refer to tetanus infections from firework displays during 4th of July celebrations. Patriotic tetanus. Indeed, patriotic tetanus was so prevalent in the former half of the 20th century that, from 1901 to 1910, 56 people on average died per year from firework-related tetanus infections on the 4th of July. 
The Journal of the American Medical Association underwent a massive targeted education campaign that argued that American lawmakers refusing to regulate the fireworks used on the 4th of July celebrations were, at best, criminally negligent in the deaths that occurred in their cities. The New York Tribune recorded the number of deaths per year and determined that half the lives lost in the 4th of July accidents were women and children and argued for the conviction and hanging of those they called murderers in order to cure one of the worst of the many evils of Independence Day and stop the children from slaughtering themselves. To this day, Chicago still has a citywide ban on fireworks of any kind. One even cared so much about the ban to write a poem in the Chicago Day book entitled, We'll Have Both of Our Eyes After the Fourth of July. It reads, Nick's on the lockjaw, Nick's on the maim, Loud noise explosives are out of the game. Fourth of July scares have all been excused. You'll just have to yell if you're over-enthused. Though it wasn't all bad, as these deaths forced the American Medical Association to expedite the development of an antitoxin, which drastically reduced tetanus-related deaths during World Demonetization 1. The long and short of it is that tetanus is no joke. If you find yourself with an injury that has been contaminated with soil or other substances that C. tetani can be found in, Monitor your injury and get to the hospital immediately if you begin to experience symptoms. Prevention is probably the better option though. We don't want to tell anyone what they should do with their bodies. However, both the Centers for Disease Control and Health Canada recommend a combination of vaccines including diphtheria, tetanus, and whooping cough, which they say can lessen or eliminate all symptoms. Both organizations also recommend being vaccinated every 10 years or so. The world is full of many dangerous diseases and afflictions, and there are plenty of different treatments that different groups recommend. It's good to be skeptical about what you're putting in your body. The most important thing is that we make these decisions from an informed position, and that we know how to find reputable sources. The rust on an old nail isn't the thing that's giving you tetanus. You're in danger of it no matter which nail you step on. Just be careful, know your body, and don't get nailed by tetanus. Ugh. <laughs> Listening to your jokes is really backbreaking, huh? Huh? <laughs> Cause you know the spasms can break your spine. Grill, that's not funny. People died. Screw you, hypocrites. I'm gonna go look at some cats. Is someone feline catty today? Scottish Fold, Munchkin, Tiger, Likoi, Ragdoll, Bowman, Selkirk Rex, Ragamuffin, Nebelong, Van, Minskin, Corat, Laperm, Pixie Bob.